Hey, it's Jenny from Creature Cove. Is broomating necessary for breeding? Let's find out. Hi everyone, this is Max. He's gonna be my helper today. He's a Magdalena, Het Anry, Rosie Boa. And today I wanna to kinda of talk about some experimental breeding projects we have going on with our rosy pairs this year. So first, let's, this is not a how-to broommate video. This is more like a personal, experimental, you know, I have questions, I wanna find out answers, and I wanna find them out for myself because every breeder I've talked to always has a different opinion and you can never really find out an exact answer. So I am gonna find out for myself. So one of the questions I always had was, do you have to broomate your snake in order for them to breed? And first let's talk about what is brumation? So brumation is the way that they will survive, that reptiles survive through the colder periods when there's less, obviously less heat, but also less prey and resources for them. So they will, go into little burrows or whatnot and kind of hunker down, their digestive system actually will tremendously slow or even stop completely. And then their breathing will slow down. Their whole system just kind of slows way down for an extended period of time. And then when it warms up again back to their temperatures, they'll come back out and keep going with life. <laughs> Some of the benefits as far as breeding goes. So this isn't if it's just a pet snake, this is strictly for if you're breeding. Some of the benefits are that it will kick the male's uh, sperm system into generating more sperm. For females, it will get their reproductive system kind of like, hey, all right, it's time to ovulate and start that whole system. It also aligns the snake's breeding seasons, so everybody wakes up together and they go through the same process at the same time. So you have kind of, they say you have higher chance of successful breeding if you brewmate. Obviously there's risks, you could lose them. They could die if you put them down into brumation and they weren't ready or they didn't fully digest and then excrete all of their feedings, you could lose them. It's, it's sad, but it does happen. And I don't want to lose any of my babies because I love them. Plus, going through the brumation season, that's like a full three months from start in late October or right at the very beginning of November. And they'll be down all the way until like March 1st, which is when we would wake up the rosies. So that's a long time without my babies. And going through winter, like what else do you do? You're stuck indoors. I just want to, you know, that's when I would play with the babies the most. So I want to see if we can breed them without brumating them. So we actually have three sets that we are including in this experiment. And we have one pair, which is Slinky and Poppy, who is kind of like our control pair. So they have been brumated and brumated in the normal way. They were down for the three months, brought back up to temp, and we have them together. Now there's two other ways people have said you can breed them. And that is one, to not do anything. You just keep them up all winter, go on with life normally, and then pair them during their normal mating season. And so we have one pair, which is Peaky and Black Dahlia, who we did that way. They did not brumate at all this winter, and we paired them at the same time we paired these guys at the beginning of March. And then the, the next way, the third way we're doing it is our is this guy, Max and his girlfriend, Magnolia. She's she is an Anri Magdalena locale. And these guys we did a little differently. When I had them in the rack system, we just lowered their temperature. We took them down to 70 for two weeks and then brought them back up to temp. And it is said that sometimes that's all you have to do to trigger the females to start ovulating and the males to produce sperm. But I, so I wanted to try it all these ways. I can deal quite easily with two weeks of, you know, letting them chill and, and go through it. But 
If I don't have to go through a full brumation cycle, I really don't want to because I, I love them. Another benefit for the big, the large scale breeding people, it actually helps them save a lot of money and a lot of time because while they're down for that long, you do not feed them at all. So that, I mean, three months of saving on feeders and whatnot, that can add up when you have a large scale and you don't have to really take care of them because they're not going to be pooping and so you don't have to clean much. You just have to change out their water about once a week because they will drink through brumation. They won't eat, but they still drink. And so that can be a huge relief also. And you don't have the bills that you would normally from heating them. I do have to say all three females have are going through ovulation right now. They started at almost exactly the same time. And the way you can tell they're ovulating is they get thick. If you had watched my uh, reptile room tour part two, we show you, you know, a little snippet of each of these snakes. And you can kind of see, I mean, the camera will never do it justice. I mean, they just look hugely obese, but they're not. They're ovulating and they can do this from like seven to 14 days they'll get super thick and that's kind of how you know that they're ovulating and all three have done that. Also, this guy's wife, our Magdalena, the ones that we brought down for two weeks and brought back up to temp, she has actually already shed. And now it is said, which for us isn't normally, it doesn't always work out perfectly, but their first shed after putting them together is supposed to signify about 90 days out from dropping babies, from having the babies. She has actually already shed. So technically, if she is going to have babies, she will have babies in September, which is about three months away from now. And so I also, I'm gonna keep track of that because they'll shed more than just the once. And the closer you get to when they would drop their babies is it's, it becomes more reliant on their shed cycle and then the days you know when they're gonna drop their babies. But like the 90 days out one, eh, it's a little sketchy. It doesn't always work that way. But she has shed, which I'm excited about. I also like that our control pair I have their history of their breeding. So I know like just last year she had six babies and she's been consistent with that. So if the background, as long as she has another litter of six-ish, we know that like, there you go. Everything's right with that. It worked well, fully brumating, bringing them back up to temp. So we'll see. The only thing I don't have is the breeding history of the other two females. Don't know anything about Black Dolly as far as her breeding goes. I actually don't think she, she may be a first time mom. So unfortunately we may have to deal with, okay, well, if she doesn't have as many babies, does that, is that because she might be a first time mom or, you know, so we actually will probably do this for a few years in a row, get all the research and make sure things are working. And I'm super excited to see what happens and we'll definitely keep you guys updated. I'm super excited to see that they are ovulating and even the ones that didn't brumate at all in any way, she's hitting the spot the way she's supposed to go. So again, I'm super, super excited. And I hope, I still hope they drop babies because I would love to not brewmate or at least some babies. I would be okay with even some, you know, having some fertility rate would be great. And I'd be happy with that too, as long as I have them during the winter. So this will be fun. I'll learn for myself what's going on and what the truth is or what works best for us. And until then, we'll see you guys. Bye.